If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of First Seahawks. <laughs> Actually, the Gospel of John. We've been looking at chapters, uh, chapter one, and we have a handout in your bulletin that covers chapter one and two. And um, we're uh, another thing that I wanted to mention to you is uh, emphasize again that we have a delicious lunch prepared right afterwards for our discovery brunch and. If you haven't been through it for a while, you're welcome to be involved in it. The purpose of that is to get everyone connected so that we're not just a, a performance center, that we're a, um, a family, a church family, and then we can build relationships. And this is the way that you can get involved and use your gifts and, and find out how to plug into the church. And it's the beginning of that process. And Or if you don't want to get involved, then you can just hear about what the church stands for and we can get to know you better because we want to have lifelong friendships and relationships. And my wife, Jackie, organizes that uh, brunch. I told her, you know, there might not be as many people as you think are going to be there. And she said, why? Um, the Seahawks game was yesterday. And I said, well, there's a really good game on after church. It's the Packers and the Cowboys. And she said, well, that's not going to cause a problem. I said, I'm actually thinking about calling in sick. That's what a problem is. <laughs> but in um, the gospel, according to John, we see some words that continue on with the series on living life with margin. Last week we had, or last night we had an interesting service because we had a, a worship service exactly at the same time as the game. And I thought nobody was going to be there, but actually our attendance was, even with what it always is, this is a committed group of people. And everyone came wearing a Seahawks jersey or clothing or something. And, um, and, all of us were talking about how we're fighting temptation, that you know, we had a commitment to be here, a commitment to one another, and, and right when we're in the hallway, kind of t or the foyer talking about it, Pastor Michael came up wearing his Seahawks jersey and said, you know, um, I need to reach another family for Christ, and, and I've been invited over to go to the Seahawks game, so I'm, can I have the evening off? And boy, did he get a bad time from everyone. I said, Michael's been working so much overtime, he deserves the evening off. And, and then as we got together, I gave them the good news and the bad news. The good news was, since they sacrificed to come to that service, every single person in attendance got a brand new Seahawks jersey. And they're like, wow, that's great. And I said, the bad news is that you need to change with him, and you need to change with him. <laughs> but... Um, we ended 15 minutes early with the agreement they would spread the word around to all the rest of the worship services that we had gone an hour over time. We were so pious. And, and you notice when we started winning, it's when the people from the Saturday night service got there to watch the game in the second half. And um, in the book of John, we see this series. Pastor Ray is going to be back here next week. It's so, such a privilege to share the pulpit with him. And he's the young good-looking one with hair, and I'm the opposite of that. I'm a, from Bizarro World, um, so I'm the old, bad-looking guy with no hair. And um, he's going to be te teaching on living life with margin in your family, because there's this little thing that goes on in as you have spiritual fervor for Jesus Christ or, or Christianity, and it's called life. You still have kids and grandkids. You still have work and responsibilities. We have community responsibilities. And many times we get distracted between religion and following Jesus Christ, who said that I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So if you follow Jesus Christ, you should be easier to laugh. You should be uh, quick to forgive. You should be kind, not carry around the burden of the world. Because religion's about pointing fingers, even if you're pointing them at yourself. And a relationship with Jesus Christ, the center of life, is, is so freeing. And it's something that's freeing the first time when you commit your life to Christ. And it's something that's freeing when we start to get stagnant in our faith and we start to feel spiritually superior. The second that you experience pride, every one of us wrestles with pride. Is there anyone here that hasn't wrestled with pride? Raise your hand if you haven't. Because if you raise your hand, you have, right? <laughs> Pride leads to the fall. We see Jesus, he's humble. He teaches the humility of life that is hard for us to understand. Come unto me, he says, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And it's a rest that people don't understand. The times of testing, 
there's a resting that goes on with God. And many of you will confess that whenever you were going through a divorce or whenever you had a financial setback or whenever the doctor told you that you're having a life-threatening illness, that God was closer to you in such a real and vital way that, that your spirit was actually lifted. You felt more loved. And how can you keep it all the time? Because the time of testing is a time of blessing because God's in control and all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose as long as we remember that he's God and we're not. If we start thinking that we're God, which is a natural tendency of humanity, is this, we, wow, look how much I've grown. Look how superior I am. And then we become religious. And that stagnates. So at the very beginning, let me review. We see this poetic, some of the most poetic words in all of literature from the Gospel of John. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. We see, in the beginning was the word, the logos, the theory of everything, the divine principle that holds the entire universe together. That's who Jesus Christ is. In the beginning was the word. The word already existed in the beginning. And the word was with God. It's really hard to understand. But it should be hard to understand when you're thinking about God, right? And the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God, and God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. Sometimes people you love, you need to remember who they are. And you're reminded who they are. I love my mom and dad. We have four boys in our family, and... and, and we have a very close family. And uh, last week I had a cold, as you know, I didn't shake hands with anyone, and it didn't hold me back from going to work, but my mom was a nurse, and, and I had this habit, as all four boys have, and we all played football, and we all think we're rough and tough, but when we get sick and have a cold, we call our mom and say, Mom, I have a cold. <laughs> and she says, poor boy. <laughs> we say thank you and then we go back to work as long as our mom knows that we have a cold we feel alright but we'd forget who our mom was our mom worked the night shift at Kenwick General Hospital and the emergency room and other places like that with Jeannie's mom who was one of her best friends and, and Russ's mom and there's a bunch of the, the night shift workers at Kenwick General that formed the kernel of this church but we'd go to visit them at the hospital and they were in charge at the hospital weren't they the doctors actually did what they said. They knew all the gossip of all the town. They had more fun working together. And I would see my mom playful. I'd see her working together. And I would remember who she was. Or I'd see my dad. And he was a pastor. And he was a friend. And so growing up as a boy, um, every Sunday afternoon we played football. And my dad would come back on Sunday evening because we always had church on Sunday evening. And he would preach. Instead of preparing a sermon, he spent his time with his boys playing football. And I remember who my dad was. Or I'd see him do a wedding at a professional baseball player's game, and they'd call him Reverend White, and he'd go out there. At the, during the seventh inning stretch, he actually performed a wedding at Sanders Jacobs Field, and they raised the bats, and the couple came forward, and I'm like, wow, that's my dad out there. That's who my dad is. Well, sometimes we need to remember who our God is, who Jesus Christ is. That he's God. And we're not him. We're quick to speak for him because he's not around. We're quick to get everything organized for him. We're quick to think that we know everything about him. And that starts to become stagnant and that hurts our relationship with our wives, our wives, our wife, <laughs> and our children, and our grandchildren and our grandparents and other people in the church and the relationships become inauthentic when we lose that margin. That's what we're talking about, the margin. The space between us and God, which we see is taught in this first chapter of John. So reviewing, uh, John was a disciple of John the Baptist. So John was the beloved disciple. He's the one who would hug Jesus when everyone else would stand afar. In our family, no one hugged except for my little brother Steve, who became the biggest brother. He's 6'5". And he was always the one that would hug everyone. He was kind of the glue of the whole family. Well, John was like that. He was the beloved. He would, he would hug. He would love everyone. 
And he was a follower of John the Baptist, who was a rock star, who was a hero of that day. And the theme we, he picks up in, in the Gospel of John is, John the Baptist, this great rock star, knew that he wasn't God. He pointed to Jesus Christ and said, there's the Lamb of God. I'm not worthy to tie his shoes. Now, if you've been coming to this church for a while, you know that I have this thing about feet. I hate feet. Uh, I wish God would have created us without stinky feet. And, um, and when I was raising my kids, my daughter Elise knew that I hated feet. And so we're on a long trip going to Disneyland, driving in our van, our minivan. There would be like these feet that would appear on my shoulder, you know. <laughs> and I was like, can't you do something with those feet? And she called me yesterday to say that Elijah's doing the same thing now. So turnabout's fair play. And the first phrase that Isabella says is, stinky feet, stinky feet. And Elijah chases around with stinky feet. Well, John the Baptist says, I'm not even worthy to get down and untie or tie the shoelaces of that man's feet. In other words, I'm, that's a dramatic way of saying, there's God, I'm not him. He was known because he was humble and he kept that understanding. And you're going to be mighty in your faith. You're going to be peaceful in your faith. You're going to be non-judgmental in your faith. You're going to be gracious in your faith. You're going to have the margin that allows you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, and self-control. You're going to have that as long as you don't make the same mistake that we all keep making. And that's when you start thinking, we're God. And the more successful you are, the more educated you are, the wealthy you are, uh, the more sophisticated you are, the more accomplished you are, the harder it is to remember that. That's going to be a temptation. Not impossible, Jesus said, but it's a temptation. And so we re need to remember that there needs to be a margin. A margin allows us to, have, to do the right things, not to be burned out. You know, the Seahawks have margin, don't they? They don't line all 11 people up on the front line. They have linebackers back there with space to move and to commit to the right area. And defensive backs like Cam Chancellor, they can go flying over the line <laughs> twice in a row. Can run up and intercept. They play with margin. But even more than that, I think uh, Coach Pete Carroll is just a great hero of mine. He's so positive. And, and they almost have a Christian aspect is that they play for fun and not for pressure. They won't even allow the press to talk them in about the next week, right? It's the week right ahead of them. And does anyone coach have more fun? He's the second oldest coach in the NFL. Does any coach have more fun than Coach Pete Carroll? I mean, he takes Marshawn Lynch, and everyone's afraid of him, and he holds him out with margin till the second quarter like they did the week before, said he had a tummy ache. Now, come on, Marshawn Lynch, a tummy ache wouldn't hold him back, but he's being in reserve, letting everybody get worn out. And then he gave him a handful of Skittles and said, get in there. <laughs> and he just ran over. He had beast mode too. Because he had margin. And the Seahawks have learned to have that capacity for life. So if you're following on the handout, I'm not going to follow the handout. But the points are going to be made. The very first miracle in John that Jesus ever does is not healing a leper. It's not making the blind to see. There's all great miracles that Jesus does, causing the lame to walk. The first miracle Jesus does is he buys a second round of wine for everyone at the wedding. Doesn't seem like the first miracle that Jesus should do would be to provide water for the desert in the Sahara Desert or something like that, something big like that. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. And his mom, that had this special relationship, came to him and said, you know, my friends are going to be embarrassed. And Jesus, in all of his busy schedule, had time to go to a wedding, to go to a party. And if you've ever been to a Jewish wedding, uh, it, it's a party. In fact, one of my kids wanted to become a Jewish Christian so they could get both the holidays. And um, it's a huge party. And, um, and so Jesus goes to it, and they run out of wine. It's just going to be a slight embarrassment, but Jesus turns water into wine. It just shatters people's concept of Jesus. Unless you realize that he came about this little thing that we do, and it's called life. It means joy. It means relationships. 
It means not being on a crusade to murder other people because we know it all, or to point fingers, or to be so judgmental. It means we remember who God is and who isn't God, and we have the capacity. And so Jesus said mind-boggling things like, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you more burden than you can ever handle. Is that what he says? No, he says, I'll give you rest. Now that difference, that enigma, hides a truth that's essential to all of our lives. Because Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you need to pick up your cross and follow me. You have to give 100%. I'm a pastor. I, I, I'm the most surprised person in the world to be a pastor. When I spoke at my class reunion, everyone laughed that I was, had become a pastor because my dad was a pastor, my grandpa was a pastor. I never thought I would ever become a pastor. But I'm ready to die for this church. I believe in what this church does. Just like the firemen here are ready to give their lives going in to rescue someone. And they've done that. And police officers that we pray for, they put their lives on the line. And soldiers that go overseas, it was Bill's job to train them that they didn't die in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, we don't want firemen to die, and we don't want policemen to die, and we don't want pastors to, to die serving the Lord. But how do you mix that radical nature that you're willing to give your all and still living life with margin? It's very hard. And unless you're in a healthy community, and we're trying to build a healthy community here, it's, it's impossible to do. You have people around you that remind you and help you and, and build you up and remind you that there's a God that can take care of the problems and minister to us. So that's so essential in our lives is to have that margin in our lives, that ability to see and to remember that, that we're not God and also to confess it's going to be my temptation to get religious. Watch out for it. The Pharisees became religious. They were the most religious ones of all. They had the greatest stumbling to go on. I was blessed early on in my ministry speak at a conference in Portland, Oregon, and Frank Harrington, the pastor of the largest Presbyterian church in the world at that time, and it was Peachtree Presbyterian Church in Atlanta, was there. What a saintly person. And he spotted me. I was 29 years old. And um, he said... Tim, I want to take you out for lunch. And so he took me out for lunch. And you know what he talked to me about was margin. I have another friend, Len Sweets, written a lot of books, lives in the islands um, here in Washington State, but he teaches all over the country, and a prolific writer. And he was telling the story about when he last saw Frank Harrington, because Len Sweet is a Wesleyan theologian, and Frank Harrington's a Presbyterian, and he's a Calvinist. That doesn't mean a lot to you, but they've been kind of batting heads for uh, since time began. And so every year, Frank Harrington would have Lynn Sweet come to the Peachtree Presbyterian Church. And he'd say, you know, a lot of what Lynn Sweet says makes me mad. It gets underneath my skin. But you need to listen to him because he speaks to, God speaks through him to me. And so I want him just to speak to you. And, and he would have an annual retreat. The last time he was at Peachtree Presbyterian Church, he did that. And he went to lunch with Frank Harrington. Frank Harrington, pastor of this huge, huge church in Atlanta, uh, everyone knew him in Atlanta, and so he spoke to everyone in the restaurant. He came and sat next to Len, and Len looked at him, and he could see how tired he was on his face. And he said, Frank, it looks like you need a sabbatical. And he did. He said, thank you for speaking into my life. But it wasn't too long after that that he became ill, and he got pneumonia, and, and he didn't have the physical reserves, even though he was... Um, 65 years old or something like that, I think, at that point. And he passed on to heaven. In other words, it's the duty of a healthy community to remind one another who Jesus is, that he has it in his hands. Isn't that what we do? Isn't that what moms do for their children? When we boys would come home from school and we'd tell our parents what great games we had, we'd set new records or all these different things, my mom would say, go mow the lawn. And she'd purposely throw away all of our trophies and all our newspaper clippings because she didn't want us to read her own clippings. It was her job and still is to this day to remind us who we are. 
at who God is. There is a God, and you're not him. For most people that struggle in a relationship with God, you know, it isn't that they are really truly atheists. And when it comes down to it, they think they're God. They work like they're God. They think they're in control of their whole universe like they're God. Even though they can see the design of the universe. And an incredible moment of conversion is when you admit you're not God. You can't control it all. You can't judge enough. You can't assign the blame. It's not doing any good. Your communication is becoming less effective. When you begin to live that life with margin, then you have joy and peace and patience and gentleness and kindness and self-control. But we can't do that at every moment in our life, every point of growth, unless we remember who God is. I remember a lady came into me for counseling and she, she had made so many mistakes and horrible mistakes in her life and, and she'd gone to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist referred her to me and, and she was just so burdened by the guilt and she would not forgive herself. Everyone else would forgive her but she wouldn't forgive herself and the single mom was just rot. You can see it across her face with this heavy burden and as she confessed her mistakes to me, I said, you know, Jesus died on the cross so that you can be forgiven. You're not the first and you won't be the last. We all need that. She said, not me. I've done too much. And I said, well, okay. Can you help me with this young girl that I know of who's made a few of the same mistakes that you've made? She won't forgive herself. She's devastated. I mean, she's headed down the wrong path and she's so full of shame. And the lady just immediately, the tears dried up and she said, now that's a cause I could get behind. Show me where that young girl is. I'm going to go talk her into forgiving herself. And I said, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> God feels the same way about you. You can't forgive yourself unless you admit you're not God, right? And you can't forgive other people. You can't be a source of grace. You can't be that joy that goes for. Your relationships aren't long-term and long-lasting because we become religious. Every church has to keep splitting all the time because someone gets more religious. You ever see that cartoon of the one guy that's trapped on a desert island by himself? And there's three churches that he built there on the, on the uh, island. There's the first Baptist church, the second Baptist church, and the third Baptist church. And finally, when they say to him, they say, why do you have three churches and one person? He said, well, I quit the first two. <laughs> and no one's going to be holy enough. Nothing's going to be right enough as long as we s slip in that place that every human being wrestles with. I confess I've wrestled with it. To start thinking, I, I have to do it all. It's all on me. I have to control it all. But Washington Cathedral is a church. We're not the church. We're not the perfect church. Have we ever claimed to be? We're part of a mosaic of churches. We have a calling that's from God. A calling to be a place of grace. A place of healing. A calling to be a place for people that are far from God. That can come. That are broken and wounded. And they can recover. And they can be treated with dignity. A place where we can have a conversation with someone that, has, uh, that can last for years where they disagree with us and they can be treated with dignity and respect. And to build a great, caring network, loving people like Jesus would love them and be in that equation. That's, that's what our calling is. We can't be all things to all people. But we can all be in that conversation as long as we have that margin in our lives. Well, how do you tell if you have that margin? You can tell it in your finances. If you're living up to 100%, 110% of your finances going into debt all the time, you're not living with margin. And one of the reasons we tithe or we save 10% as I was taught and to tithe 10% is to live life with margin. Now, in our church, you never have to give. I give you the past. You never have to give because we don't want anyone to give that's giving out of, um, I have to. No, the we're going to live on the budget that we have and we're going to be the church that we're supposed to be. But we also need to teach people the biblical principles of living life with margin in our finances and living life in margin with our health, our physical health. While we want to finish the race and strain towards the prize, we could have something left to finish that race when God wants us to. To hit the pace that God wants us to have. The only way you have that, the only way God can communicate that to you is through healthy people who have healthy relationships. 
So when someone becomes healthy and they realize they're not God, but there is a God, and there's a margin in between us, and there needs to be a margin in the way, time to raise our kids, time to have our family, time to live life, time to engage in the community, time to take care of ourselves. When one person becomes more healthy that way, everyone around them starts to become more healthy, especially if they're not judgmental. And they're loving and kind. And we owe our life to that. So every policeman, every firefighter, everyone that's ever gone overseas to fight for our nation, there are many in our church family that do all those things. Every pastor who's called to give their life to the sheep, we live because we're in a healthy community. Or some churches just gobble up pastors, right? Because they forget that. We live because we're in a healthy community that believes that Jesus is God. And we walk with him. We get to see who he is. We get to trust him. We get people to remind us, hey, it's not all on you. You don't have to do this all by yourself. And um, your life becomes much easier. You don't have to worry about tomorrow. You can be like the Seahawks. You can worry about the game in front of you. Be focused completely on that. And God will be there for you every single time, 100% of the time. When we first moved into this church, we had to take out one foot of concrete, because there's so much mud here, one foot of concrete that was all around between the barn, all the lower part of the campus there. So we had a work day. I think two of us showed up for that work day. And it was to break out the concrete. We got sledgehammers. And we started breaking. I've had that job before. That was a hard job to break out, even a driveway with sledgehammers. But when it's one foot thick, I'd never hit concrete so thick. I mean, it wasn't doing anything. We were trying spikes. I think Bob Baird might have been the other person that was there. I don't remember if he remembers this. But there was a, two of us that were there pounding. And then finally someone showed up and said, what are you guys doing? We've been working all day long. And we couldn't break that concrete up. I and mean, we just had one little chunk out. And we're like, yeah, we got a chunk out. At this rate, in 44 years, we'll have the concrete torn up so we can do the building program. And someone said, let's rent a jackhammer. And boy, did we have fun. Putting that jackhammer on. Boom, right through. Boom, boom. My belly would get on thing and just shake. Boom. And no time, and a few hours, we had all that concrete up. Well, a lot of us are pounding with sledgehammers when God wants to do it for us. He wants to help us. He wants to be the margin in our lives. You can't quit an addiction. You can't make a marriage work. You can't live with joy. You can't be victorious. You can't have grace. You can't be non judgmental without God. And you're not Him. Last Saturday, Jackie and I, had, you know, we care so much, and, and Jackie especially, she just cares so deeply, and, and we're facing a major discouragement, and, and, and that's part of caring, and at that point of discouragement, Jackie and I are talking, and we said, boy, we feel so much anxiety about this, and so much stress, and, and um, I said, you know, we're going to have to pray the prayer that I always pray, God pick me up. We can't even make sense of all this, just let's pray the prayer, God pick me up. And that, for those of you who aren't familiar with that, we ask God to work a miracle in our life that he does. It may not change the situation, but it's our obligation to respond and to know that God's with us, that he is going to take care of the situation, and we don't have to. At 2 o'clock in the morning, someone from our church sent Jackie a text message. And I'm not saying this so that you'll send text messages to Jackie at 2 o'clock in the morning. But at 2 o'clock in the morning, someone knew what we were going through. And they were very close to the situation. And they said, I know how hard this must be for you, but I just want to tell you that your ministry at Washington Cathedral has saved my life. I wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for the ministry that's going on here. The graciousness, the approach that you have. Keep it up. When we got through, it said more than that, it just stirred our hearts when we, when we read it. We thought at first it was like one of our kids because our grandchildren had been having the flu and they were texting at 2 o'clock in the morning and Jackie got up to answer it so we could call him and say, no way, you take care of him. We had to take care of you in the middle of the night, you know, that answer. Um, but it wasn't. It was, it was the text that of encouragement and we both had to say, there, there it is. That's God answering our prayer. Now it's our 
responsible to remember that he's God. He's in control. He's going to take everything to let him have the burden. What a great way to live. What a healthy community to have. Stand with me for a closing benediction. Now unto him who is able to keep you and to make you strong, to do far more than you could ever ask or imagine. God, it is so difficult for us. We want to control. We want to be so spiritual and we want to be in charge and it's so hard for us to remember who you are and who we are but God I pray for these people that I love with all my heart and all my soul that you would instill in our church a health that would be contagious it would spread from family to family to single to single throughout this whole church of people who can be gracious be forgiving, can be burden free, can focus on what's right ahead, can celebrate with the joy that we see in the Christian principles the Seahawks are practicing. God, help us to be that team of margin, that people of with margin realizing who you are. We pray this in the sweet name of Jesus. Amen. At the close of our